Hello everyone and welcome to this recorded and thus slightly awkward talk on the believable, memorable game city. Uh, more like the construction of the believable, memorable game city. As uh, for me, I am Konstantinos Dimopoulos and I am a game urbanist. That is, I am someone with a PhD in urban planning and city geography who for the past almost decade have been working in games and have been trying to combine level and game design with uh, methods and knowledge of uh, city geography and urban planning. I have so far consulted and helped create the urban environments and systems for uh, several games, including uh, Place for the Unwilling, um, The Sinking City by Frogwares, and the forthcoming Lake Indie Game by Gamius. I have also very recently published my first book. It's called uh, Virtual Cities, and it is an atlas and exploration of. Uh, 45 iconic and I would say historically important game cities and have lately been also doubling in you know bringing my trade and uh, combination of uh, game and city design into the pen and paper and have been working on an uh, still an announceable project but also on ex novo a playable um, city generator uh, that sits somewhere between an RPG and a board game and something we have created with uh, dear uh, Martin Rurkar a few months ago. Anyway, that's enough about me, let's uh, try and focus on the point of the talk. And let's start by the very obvious question of what game cities are. Well, game cities are all the cities and all the urban environments that can be found in games. This is pretty much obvious, I imagine, but in reality, game cities are much more than that. They uh, have a lot of facets to them and a lot of elements that have to be taken into account. So, first of all, a game city has to be, or at least attempts to be, a hopefully believable illusion. It also is a game space that has to be approached via the methods and techniques of level design and be arranged in a way that can be enjoyable to play in. And absolutely, it is also a simulation, at least up to a point. An illusion has to at least borrow some of the systems and realities of actual life and transform them into a virtual version of themselves. And then game cities are also, you know, narrative actors. They are important in plots and they are able to do environmental storytelling on a grand scale. They can be interesting in diegetic scenery. And they're definitely excellent and pithy showcases of world building. Sometimes, you know, a city can encapsulate all the crucial and important bits of a specific game world, especially an imaginary one. And they're also incredibly varied. We have, you know, large and simple and completely abstracted, almost token-like cities, all the way to, you know, open world or cartoon takes on the on the space. And game cities are also, you know, major stages for gameplay and storytelling. They are some of the most important sceneries in games, and they're also something that people feel they can easily understand and relate to. They're also complex configurations and as such they have to be abstracted and made manageable and made in ways that you know even a modestly uh, sized studio can perhaps uh, tackle them. Now another quality that is uh, something I'm looking for at least in, in game cities is them being memorable. That they are places that we remember, places that stick with us, places that we can reminisce and even maybe feel nostalgic about. Um, to achieve this, a uh, game city has to usually be built around a strong thematic axis. Sometimes, you know, more than one themes can be combined together to create something truly interesting. Uh, and such themes or, or aspects, if you will, can be anything from extreme class division, uh, you know, this topic unsettling ideologies, um, far off technologies, or you know, awkward technologies, something like you know, 
uh, steampunk, for example, that they can be a sense of community, they can refer to cosmic horrors and unexpected magics, they can feature distinctive architectural landmarks or very unique economies, they, they can showcase, you know, long histories and ancient uh, original settings, and they can uh, be all about, you know, their exotic surroundings, their exotic or dangerous surroundings and hinterlands. They can feature characteristic landmarks and uh, major historic references and, and all those things that can actually provide us with very good starting points when it comes to creating something that is memorable. Um, of course, you know, being believable and realistic, and when I say realistic, I mean between uh, within the specific context of a predefined game world, of course, uh, and also being uh, complex and filled with life and feeling vibrant is not something that will guarantee a city's memorability, but it will definitely help make it a good game city. And being a good game city is almost a requirement if not absolutely a requirement for crafting a, a memorable game city. So a good game city will also have to be compatible and supportive of a game's uh, you know, mechanical needs, of its, of its atmosphere, of its uh, clock bits, of its uh, storytelling and narrative demands. One has to keep in mind that imagination and inspiration and so a bit of research too will be very helpful when we strive for for originality when we really want our places to be distinctive we have to draw from all sorts of, of creative pools we don't have we have to move away you know from the very obvious references from from the dominant mainstream uh, narratives and you know star wars and other games etc we, we have to look into art, we have to look into cinema, we have to look in, into literature, we have to look even into, into science. We have to keep an open and fertile mind and try to, to take all sorts of wonderful ideas and incorporate them into our world building and city building. Now, some examples of uh, memorable cities, just to, to show you what I mean. First of all, we have Anor Londo from uh, Dark Souls, a completely gothic space, uh, a, a town essentially comprising of cathedrals, which somehow manages to make sense and be incredibly atmospheric and have this familiar yet unsettling version of the Duomo di Milano at its uh, very heart, uh, uh, very and essentially unforgettable horror city to, to, to play in then I absolutely have to also mention the recently remastered Midgar from Final Fantasy VII, one of my favorite and most legible cities. Not only is it very successful in conjuring its unique take on cyberpunk, it is also you know very legible. You have this huge corporate headquarter at its core, surrounded by a pizza-like superstructure of eight sectors, below which lie the poor slums and the vast seas of you know almost hopeless but not quite inhabitants of the rest it's a it's a very very unique place and one that has absolutely stood the test of time and then we have uh, Kamurocha which is this uh, fantastical um, imaginary take on Tokyo's red light district a place I remember mostly for for its for it being packed with detail for for its you know vibrant contrasting colorful signs uh, for for its characters and and the depth of uh, you know interaction it offers to to people it might be an open world and a small one but it's still something that I can easily conjure as a cohesive whole in my mind and then one of uh, my favorite cities and one of the more interestingly crafted places in, in gaming which has which has to be rupture from uh, the first two bioshock games this is this is a place that has been built around two axes that the first axis is the the subjectivist ideology which which leads it to wild dystopia of uh, freak mutants who tend to murder each other and you the player and that's the one and the second one is the fact that it's it's being built underwater 
and this environment imposes all sorts of limitations and demands. Add to it, you know, some sensible choices such as the the Art Deco atmosphere and architecture, and and you have this this fantastic creation. Um, moving on, we have. Uh, the city of Rockville from uh, Infocom's classic text adventure and Mind Forever Voyaging. This uh, is a game I've decided to show you in order to point out that a city can be memorable even if it's made only of text, if, even if it's, uh, you know, almost, not almost, more than 30 years old. So a Mind Forever Voyaging offers a very sensibly planned, very cohesive, initially completely a remarkable place that eventually devolves over uh, you know 10 year steps into into complete post-apocalyptic um, hellscape absolutely worth checking out it's, it's one of the most dynamic things ever created too um, then definitely Dunwall a place built around an economy of uh, whale oil and absolutely City 17 from the classic Half-Life 2 which come to think of it is I think 16 or, or 17 years old this year which is quite a lot anyway what, what really strikes one when one visits um, City 17 is just how atmospheric it is how lived in it feels how it can conjure the sense of history you look at all the different eras of architecture around you you know from, from Baroque to modern to postmodern to alien architecture to to some sort of uh, Soviet and post-Soviet constructions that instantly help you realize that this is a place that has been around for quite some time. And it's also a place with a major defining new landmark at its heart, this, this combine tower which sticks out and can be seen from all over the city and helps you, you know, instantly realize that this is your goal and that this is what re really rules City 17. And I mean, also, you know, this whole uh, dystopia atmosphere has been pulled off brilliantly and the Valve managed to conjure the sense of the vast metropolis by using, you know, very, very clever routes in the city and by wisely reducing a relatively minimal set of assets. Anyway, having, say, covered the memorable part Let, let's see how we tackle the believable part of city let's let's talk a bit about urban planning and design you see good good planning and design solutions and the study of historical patterns and of course the core principles of uh, city geography as well as best design practices from across the world can and in most cases should be applied in our game cities our game cities are supposed to be simulations or simulacrums, if you want to be very postmodern about it, of, of actual cities. Please don't be very postmodern about it. Anyway, parenthesis over. And so, in order for them to feel convincing and function decently and often even look complete, they have to look to reality and borrow aspects from there. So, um, when designing, we should absolutely craft traffic hierarchies make certain that you know all roads are not of a uniform width that we have local and uh, connecting and main boulevards and those are differently ranked and service different amounts of traffic and then we also have to keep in mind things such as the fact that uh, you know a cozy square where a player avatar or an NPC is supposed to feel uh, comfortable should not be wider than 30 or 35 meters because this is the distance at which we start actually recognizing faces and thus recognizing people and this puts us at ease. And also another example would be that uh, when designing a sidewalk and talking about metrics we could say that a comfortable sidewalk should absolutely allow for two citizens to walk abreast an even more comfortable one a, a complete one would also have a frontage zone and uh, some space reserved for urban furniture or street furniture you know such as benches and, and trees and dustbins and and those uh, supplementary elements of the urban image um, always though keep in mind that city spaces in games are also game spaces. They have to adhere to the rules of, of level design and level design has to be at the core 
of, uh, of our approach. So if we are doing a city for a first person shooter, we have to keep in mind that lines of sight, for example, have to be broken up. And if we are doing, you know, a major open world city, we have to keep in mind that assets cost a lot of money. So we have to somehow find a way to make our city economical. Um, interestingly, in, in certain cases, our imaginary cities, our game cities might even aim towards a def very, very different result than what a planner would aim for. So we can essentially disregard rules regarding comfortable roads or, or safe public spaces and uh, attempt to create cities of dread, you know, places where the players will feel unwanted, places that feel hostile and probably scary. Obviously, we have to know what makes a city comfortable in order to subvert that and turn it on its head for a very different narrative effect. And also, we can you know, ignore human scale or, or, or plan uh, labyrinthine uh, street networks and you know have uh, architectures with odd symmetries and out-of-scale buildings that though those things might be frowned upon by architects and, and planners and geographers, they could absolutely help us, for example, create a very specific atmospheric need, maybe help us put the players in, in an odd psychological position. And similarly, if we, if we ignore core urban functions, and we will be talking a bit about urban functions too, we can, you know, conjure the sense of a dreamlike or impossible environment. For example, um, the team that made Thimbleweed Park uh, decided to not include residents in, in their game, hoping that this would be something that would make it feel out of place and make it feel slightly odd. Anyway, aesthetically speaking, um, you know, trying to balance order and how and chaos can, can be a very good idea. It can work wonderfully for urban environments, both real and virtual. Why? Because we as humans uh, appreciate both the sense of a planner's intelligence and forethought and the element uh, of surprise and you know combining those two can make for good looking and intriguing places generally speaking combining and mixing things up often works it is often a very good idea even when we're uh, you know talking about cities from from the top down just just combining those two different city plans for example here creates this very very unique very unexpected effect now, so on to some, um, you know, fundamentals, the, the very basics uh, of visual city crafting, if you want. First thing that we have to keep in mind is that every city has to make sense. Every city has to be coherent and follow the rules the game world sets. Why is that? Because this is the way we achieve an illusion of realism. And, and this illusion of realism is what can lead to believability and believability can lead our players to immersion. It can lead them to a specific spatial sort of immersion, make them feel there, make them suspend their disbelief and for a while inhabit a completely exotic and different place. Try not to think on the architectural scale. Try to think like planners and geographers. Cities are not you know, big buildings, cities are cities, they're much more complex than buildings, they have more needs to serve, they have different needs to serve, and absolutely let your city tell its story, let it inspire your game, let it inspire and even guide your narrative, let it, you know, enrich your uh, level design. In order to do that, you will have to research your urbanism, and by research I mean, you know, both research cities that look like the city you might want to to tackle, uh, but also try and research the science of urbanism itself too. And I can assure you that you will find solutions to problems you didn't even realize you had, and you will also find ways to, to refine things and really polish them sometimes to, to perfection. Um, please try and remember that every urban center is a historical societal construct and as history and society never stand still, it is also a dynamic and perpetual work in progress. A city always changes, always reinvents itself. Um, definitely focus on urban functions. And urban functions is a, a term to describe, uh, um, you know, when we're 
in, in engineering and in the social sciences and in geography. Uh, uh, what we mean when we say urban functions is uh, the reasons that cities exist. Uh, urban functions are what cities do and what they are meant to do. Uh, for example, an urban function would be shelter. It, uh, a city provides shelter or it provides a residence or it provides access to work and access to shopping, those things. And cities are generally built to facilitate and support urban functions and obviously evolve as those functions themselves evolve. So a medieval city would place a lot of importance on the religious function of the city and the defensive function of the city. You would almost be able to describe it by describing a cathedral and the surrounding city walls, whereas a modern city will have to absolutely allow for you know the market to work it, it will have to have shops where people will be able to buy food and to not die and then or before that doesn't really matter there's not a, a specific sequence that uh, those rules let's say have to be followed or have to be applied but one at some point has to ask the question of the three questions of when where and how big their um, city is and when means, you know, in which era and what technologies are available and what type of societies are there and where it provides the hinterland to your city and the, the geographical reference and how big obviously is important because, you know, a village functions and looks vastly different from a metropolis and the metropolis looks and functions vastly different from, I don't know, uh, a planet-sized city like, I don't know, Coruscant in, in Star Wars. So when, where, how big are three very important questions one has to ask oneself. And one has to also keep in mind, and I do mention little things to keep in mind, but sadly one does have to remember and put some emphasis on all those points raised here. So. Keep in mind that all urban space has been planned, nothing in a city is there randomly. It has been put there to service a specific need or a specific function or both. And even if we don't have, you know, an institutional form of planning, a decision has been made by someone or by a group of people. Uh, try to approach the city as a whole, try to perhaps uh, even roughly sketch it beforehand or have a general image of its structure in your mind and try to move your thoughts from the general to the specific. Uh, always remember that cities are internally differentiated. We have areas and districts where different classes move, live. We have areas and districts where different things happen. We have, you know, we can have a leisure district and we can have an industrial area and we can have a park, for example, and then we can have, you know, the old town and the new town and its expansion and so on and so forth. Um, do not ignore urban infrastructure for infrastructure is a city skeleton and by infrastructure I mean everything from the roads to the cables to the plumbing to the sewers to the communication networks to the um, you know transportation networks all those things even if you don't have to show them in detail you have to at least imply that they exist and maybe even use them to add a certain unique touch to your city if, for example I don't know a, a dam would make for a very very interesting place to have a battle in just just saying. Anyway, uh, keep in mind that all settlements have form, have a form, and this particular form is based on their structure. It expresses said structure. Absolutely consider arrivals and entrances, that is how people will for the first time approach your city, how do they enter it, and also consider landmarks, you know, the major cathedrals, the major um, skyscrapers, the things that people will remember the city for, perhaps its trademarks if you want, and also keep in mind that the boundaries of your city are an important element of it too. Uh, will it be, you know, the walls, a very heavily populated um, highway, uh, or will it be something like, you know, GTA's approach of having every city on an island? This is something that you will have to consider, especially in an urban world, in an urban, urban open world, but also when sketching your city. Um, another thing you will probably have to do will be craft your place's history. Um, as mentioned, cities are essentially the result of historical and geographical processes, and these processes will have to be even slightly simulated and partially showcased. 
Um, for example, you have to keep in mind that the civic evolution usually goes from a village to a town to a small city and then to a metropolis and possibly to a megalopolis. And as, as the settlement, for example, grows and becomes more complex, uh, th there is also an evolution that happens parallel to that, an evolution that has to do with, with politics, with economies, with, the, with technologies and even with beliefs and arts and all those things. Um, keep in mind that cities can also devolve following wider historical changes. They can be bombed to oblivion, they can be abandoned because they no longer matter, etc. Cities can also be created ex novo, from nothing, based on a very detailed plan and start evolving from there. And what's really important is that uh, both history and society and the revolution tend to build living worlds in layers so you have the ancient troy for example and above that you have like um, less ancient troy and then modern troy and parts of of every layer can still be seen up to a point and once again let me remind you that progress and evolution never really stop and that cities are always under construction so showing this fact having you know a crane or a half finished cathedral or something that eloquently tells players that this is a place that is always being built is important if you want to conjure that civic sense. Now an example of how planning produces space. Let's for a moment imagine that this, you know, the, the big yellow rectangle with the circled out edges, anyway, that the, the yellow orangey thing is a town and, you know, the blue is either an airport or a, or a gold mine or a shipyard or something really important to this plan to this town so we have those two elements in space and what planning would do would be create something to connect them say a highway from uh, the city to the airport and having produced space as planning as planners sorry then space itself starts producing its results it, it starts you know having people move to live by the highway and they create their small residences and small settlements there and then those settlements grow and you have you know more specific functions you might have if this is a city and uh, with an airport then you might have I don't know gas stations or shopping malls and stuff and so this this planning act of ours created this new reality where space started producing uh, new things and then planning has to come back and you know create a new road for example to service those new needs so if you sort of can keep this this sort of mechanism in your mind when designing a city and trying to to imagine how things uh, evolve you will be probably able to create something um, more realistic and now a, a bit more on urban functions and mostly because there's something that you know Many video games tend to, to ignore, and this is what can often lead to, you know, those paper-thin, fake, um, wrong settlements. And it, it's a very bad idea. What's more, uh, urban functions are something that can help make a city memorable. They can help differentiate between a set of uh, settlements, for example, in an open world. It's, it's urban functions that can create and lead us towards creating, you know, exploration outposts and heavily industrialized cities or, or special transportation or defense hubs, etc. Uh, an example of major contemporary urban functions, just to, to make you certain that you take what I'm talking about, would be you know, residence and commerce and production, consumption and the reproduction of humans that means, you know, schools and hospitals and everything and transportation, culture, ideology and being living in capitalist societies, we would have to make certain that the circulation of capital is allowed to happen and that people have access to drinking water, but also energy. Obviously, the functions of a medieval or a deep space settlement or, or, or a fantasy settlement of undying elves in the forest would have to, to allow for completely different functions and support completely different functions and thus look very different. Um, what's also important is that urban functions are, are not an abstract thing. They take up actual space as land uses. The spatial distribution of, the, of these land uses and organization is what we tend to describe as urban structure. And now I will show you three classic structure models of cities which can be easily modified 
to serve as starting points for the design of a brand new game city, for example. So the first model is the one of the concentric rings, where the most important thing is in the middle, and around it in rings we have the other faction. So in, in this classic Chicago early 20th century model, in the center we have the central business district, surrounded by a wider downtown, surrounded by the residents of the working class, which is in turn surrounded by suburbia and then exurbia. This could easily be retrofitted, you know, for a fantasy setting. So in the center we have the King's Castle, surrounded by the commercial area, and then we have, you know, where the nobles live, and that's where the, also the walls are, and outside we have the peasants, etc. Another take on that would be the sectoral model, which is, um, you know, a, a slight variation of the former one, or, uh, you know, this this uh, our classic uh, Chicago and again model, which is one of the multiple nuclei, and you have more than one centers, and this is a, a structure that fits, you know, a metropolis or, or a sci-fi city slightly better. For example, here you can see that in number one we have the central business district, and then in number seven we have a secondary business district, and then we have, you know, both residential and industrial suburbs, and this is something that's more uh, reminiscent of modern urbanism. So those three examples are just three ways to maybe overcome the fear of a blank page when it comes to designing a city. Uh, structures, though, do not cover the shape of streets. Those have to also be researched, and here I'm, I'm giving you two examples. The first one on the left is from the ancient city of uh, Miletus, where we have, you know, one of the first applications of the standard grid, which is one of probably the most commonly used and the most easy to adapt um, street network shape. And next to it we have the Washington's uh, plan, which was a very, very um, ideal Baroque plan. You can see the long axes and, you know, the the vast boulevards emanating from squares and central points. And then comes the reality where we tend to have, you know, more mixed stuff. On the left we have the city of Florence and you can see the combination of um, Baroque, of uh, grids, of uh, ancient Roman centers, of uh, medieval un unplanned expansion, etc. And next to it, Brussels, which is one of the many cities that was once surrounded by a wall that is no more. The residential densities of every place tend to be higher at the center and lower in the periphery, though this is not an absolute truth and it's not equally different in every city. You can see that London is less uh, dense in the center relatively to New York and that Hong Kong is almost uh, uniformly very, very dense. And contrasting the residential densities to work densities, that is where people work, helps us uh, understand and helps us model in our head the fact that people will travel from this situation to this situation every day. They will commute daily and change which places are the most dense at that particular, the, during the working hours, for example, and which places might be empty uh, during night, for example, an industrial area. And this is another important uh, thing to keep in mind when modeling our cities, at least in our minds. Uh, no matter though what we do, we cannot be incredibly detailed. Cities are vast, cities are large, and they are packed with detail. So we, whether, whether it's uh, real space we're abstracting, whether we're, we're doing what Assassin's Creed tends to do, whether we're, we're trying to, you know, simplify an existing historical city to, to show it, or whether we are creating an imaginary urban space, we still have to abstract it. We still have to only keep the detail and elements there that are enough to showcase that this is a city and that those are the important things in it. So the ways of abstracting are, are countless. I will give you just here a few examples and, you know, hope they, they get you thinking about abstraction. So on the left, we have an attempt to keep the general feeling of a road network, but simplifying how it looks 
using less assets and then in the middle we have two takes of um, abstracting historical and existing places one is from uh, Assassin's Creed the other one is from Gabriel Knight 3 and what we do here is essentially we we lower the fidelity of everything and we try to for example if we have a building block of 8 by 8 buildings we can instead model a building block of five by five buildings and no one will ever hopefully notice and next to it is the very very cartographic take on uh, abstraction and simplification which starts from you know the complete road, road network of a city in a map and this gets abstracted into the core roads and then into the vague outline of the city and finally into a symbol if you zoom in and out of google maps you will see what I mean and this is something that you should probably be doing in your game cities yourself um, then you will have to try and imply size and scale since you won't be able to model everything you will have to offload part of the modeling to the users and gamers uh, brain good thing is that even a single image can conjure the sense of uh, urban scale it can with its uh, details and its backgrounds and the fact that we know what cities look like it can help players fill the blanks in what's more symbols and implied patterns also work for example in skyrim you don't have a whole uh, in the city of whiterun you don't have a whole uh, you know nobles district with a palace you just have a big palace that sort of symbolizes the complete nobles district and speaking of um, you know topology and topologies this is a steal from the movie in the mouth of madness it's, it's a wonderful movie and what's also very interesting in our case here is that it is supposedly taking place in a small town and we're only ever shown those seven buildings you can see on screen from said town those seven buildings are arranged in a very recognizable typical pattern which we find in many small midwestern cities in the u.s and this is the pattern you see on the lower left of the screen it's like a road three buildings on one side three buildings on the other side one building at the end this implies this topology essentially implies a small town center and if you look to its um, to its right you will see the same seven buildings realigned in ways that can be anything from you know a dense downtown block to a few buildings on a rural road to a linear town on one side of the road. Another way to imply is to cut off access and show things in the background. This is what, for example, Green Fandango does here. You have this uh, lovely city of the dead, but you cannot really visit the rest of it because there's this packed carnival and it's not letting you move towards the background. But you can see in the background that this is a city of Art Deco skyscrapers so you once again fill in the blanks another cool trick is that uh, you know especially in 3d places especially in open world or larger levels showing long distances to the player is problematic not just because we give them you know line of sight which is in some in some genres is something that we'd rather not do but also because we actually show how small our world is what we can do is just keep the exact same assets and no curve them a bit and instantly stop people from realizing just how small our creation is save on GPU, on GPU and imply a much more complex and dense environment and then there's always you know the the option to procedurally fill in stuff and this can work wonderfully either when used you know for far off use and provided we have you know good um, procedural creators or um, as I, I, I think the, the, the way was in, in the sinking city was to essentially have the procedural generator create some stuff according to specific parameters and the designers uh, core plan and then go in and by hand improve and touch up on everything else um, definitely keep in mind that maps are something that can not only work that can not only help uh, people put things in place especially in games that are not um, you know open world for example in Gabriel Knight 1 or in a game like Dishonored we have those distinct spaces and being shown a map helps us 
realize their connections. But interestingly, maps can also help tell stories, as they did in Silent Hill, as they did in um, sorry in the in the Thief games. Um, moving on, another consideration is uh, navigation and legibility. How do we help our players navigate our cities and and, and game settings without resorting to you know in-game GPSs or having them break out of the experience constantly to return? So first of all, there's like the, the U in gamey ways, we can have people show them the way, we can have uh, arrows pointing them to their, towards the correct uh, direction, we can have, as Witcher did, uh, you know, relatively subtle dotted lines on the landscape for them to follow, or we, we can go with more urbanistic and more level design solutions, for example, you know, having main streets and having um, signs pointing them towards the place of interest that we want them to be informed about. Uh, more interestingly, we can help people create an urban mental map in their mind. And this is where we use the theories and um, research and work of uh, Kevin Lynch, who was a very famous and very important uh, urbanist and, and designer, who tried to come up with the five elements that make the urban map in everyone's mind. So the first thing would be paths. Those would be the routes along which uh, people move. They can be roads and boulevards or you know actual paths. And then we have edges. They, they, those are boundaries and breaks in continuity. Those could be you know waterfronts, rivers, and walls, or, or you know a very, very dangerous highway which you cannot cross on foot. On foot. And then we have districts, and those would be areas characterized by common traits. Areas that are internally coherent, they could be, you know, a red light district, or, or um, you know, the old town, or the um, a suburban area. Things that, when you are in them, you instantly realize that you are in this specific, rather unique space of town. And then we have nodes. There, are, there are focal, strategic points in the urban tissue that um, help orientation. They can be things like squares or junctions of uh, major roads. And then we absolutely have, you know, landmarks, whether they are major or minor, whether they are objective or subjective, for subjective landmarks also exist, they are important. And, you know, in level design, there is often the tendency to, to refer to landmarks as, as weenies, as, you know, the little sausages you wave at dogs to have them come to you. And we do the same with, with players. And then adding to, to Lynch's... Um, Elements we can also refer to scale, to the scale of buildings, of rows, of public spaces, you know, relative sizes. We can refer to grade and slope and uh, the how prominent the role of topography can be. How you know usually an important monument is placed on a cliff, for example. And absolutely, we should not forget that sound and the civic soundscape can also be mapped, and that people would expect, for example, to listen to the to the birds and the bees in a relatively calm pastoral suburb or to the, you know, the pistons and the heavy machinery operating in the industrial area. And here are some real life examples of, you know, a node where several major paths converge into. This is a major crossroads in Paris and in the middle of the road of the of the node, on top of it, we have this great landmark, this this um, uh, thing that shows us that usually combining, you know, elements of Lynch's uh, mental maps is a very good way to create something st truly striking, like the Arc de Triomphe. And then here we have a uh, one of my favorite examples of a district. It's it's uh, Boca in um, in Argentina, which is a, a place that's so vividly and uniquely colored that you instantly know that you oh, I'm in this particularly fantastic and one of a kind place inside Buenos Aires. I know where I am. And then, you know, just in another example of an edge, this is from Carcassonne, you have the walls, they're an absolute edge within the wider city or, in, in older days, the concrete boundary of the city. So to slowly close things up, this is a very simplified how-to, how to create a game city. Your first option would be to choose an existing city, abstract it, maybe even slightly change it, and generalize it as much as possible and do something not unlike what Assassin's Creed Syndicate or other Assassin's Creed games have done, not unlike what Gabriel Knight, Sins of the Fathers, for example, have done. 
The other slightly more complex option would be to heavily modify an existing city and make it into something almost unrecognizable. Or, you know, combine parts and sections of existing and historical cities and mixing elements up. And this is partly what Mafia did, Mafia 3 did, with, with its reimagining of New Orleans, or what Terry Pratchett famously did with Ank Morpork by combining elements from, you know, um, Victoria and London and Prague and Tallinn and even Chicago into, into one somehow coherent and completely wild civic whole. And then you can create a city from scratch, which is the most interesting and the most demanding, probably, uh, task. You will start by asking where, when, and how big. You will you should try and list its functions. And while doing that, trying to craft and layer the place's uh, history, you should come up with a rough map of both uh, the city and its uh, wider geography and try then to work from the general to the specific. You will have to you know, plan land uses and consider urban structures and add all the details that will bring this sense of life and granularity to your creation. Finally, some uh, reading suggestions. Uh, Good City Form by Kevin Lynch, um, Christopher Alexander's classic uh, pattern language, uh, Kostov's, for me, seminal, The City Shaped, and Lewis Mumford's I would say riveting the city in history and then also into more uh, game focused stuff like uh, Jana Silverstein's who was the editor of the uh, Cobalt Guide to World Building and you know the architecturings of uh, game space there's also a small interview slash article by me in there and Christopher Toten's brilliant architectural approach to level design and you know Kramer's classic level design concept theory and practice. Finally, if you would like to get in touch with me, here's my email, my Twitter handle, and my site. You can find me there. You can also find me on Facebook, which I try to limit my use of thereof, and LinkedIn. And hopefully I will see you in a while or in a virtual while on the Q&A session, I think, in a few moments. So thank you so much for your attention and your time and hope you enjoyed. Thank you. Goodbye.